name is Una and I play the harp. One of my favourite composers is the harper composer Turlock Carlin, who lived from 1670 to 1738. During his career, he composed a piece called Carlin's Concerto. Join me as I figure out the story behind this lovely little tune. During the first half of the 18th century in Ireland, Italian music was all the rage. Carlin's publishers, the Neils, built a music hall specifically for the practice of Italian music. And as if one wasn't enough, 10 years later, another one was built on Fish Amble Street. Joseph Cooper Walker in 1786 wrote of the time, music was now the rage. Italian singers were invited over and the fair dames of Ireland learned to expire at an opera. Carlin was no exception to this trend. His total fave composers of the time were Vivaldi and Corelli. His student, Charles O'Connor, said of him, the Italian compositions he preferred to all others. Vivaldi charmed him and with Corelli he was enraptured. Carlin's relationship with Corelli is probably best described as superfan. He consciously imitated Corelli's musical work and kind of adorably, we think that he might have adapted a puntastic stage name for himself based on that Italian composer. In Neil's celebrated Irish tunes, which were published in Carlin's lifetime, one of Carlin's compositions is labelled as being by Signor Carolini. I absolutely adore this name. It's a cute intercultural tip of the hat to Corelli, Carolin and Carolin's obsession with the Italian master. A bit like Celtic rock band the Red Hot Chili Pipers or the heavy metal ABBA tribute band Avatar. I swear I'm not making this up. And what's lovely is that it appears that the respect was mutual. One contemporary Irish source says the Italians held Carolyn in such high regard that they dignified him with the title Carolonius. Oh, so much love. But enough of these cute nicknames or I will explode. Bunting said in 1796 that in Carolyn's concerto and in his Madame Cole, the practitioner will perceive evident imitations of Corelli, in which the exuberant fancy of that admired composer is happily copied. Petri was a little less kind. He spoke of Carlin's ambitious wandering imitations of Italian gigas. Ouch. So I am going to leave it up to you to decide. I've recorded Carlin's concerto for you. Is it a meek little derivation? Or is it a strong standalone composition? Does it sound Irish or Italian to you? Traditional or classical? Have a listen and let me know in the comments.
So you have probably heard of Vivaldi and you may have heard of Corelli, but you probably haven't heard of Francesco Severio Geminiani. Baptised on the 5th of December in 1687, he was an Italian violinist, composer and music theorist. BBC Radio 3 has described him as now largely forgotten, but in his time considered almost a musical god, deemed to be the equal of Handel and Corelli. Giminiani studied under the violinist and composer Corelli in Rome and became one of the foremost representatives of his school. His future violin pupils would go on to call him Il Furibundo, the madman, because of his expressive rhythms. In 1714, he moved to London and he was very successful there initially, composing and teaching. Fun fact, in 1725, he joined a Masonic Lodge and was awarded the title of Perpetual Dictator. 14 years later, his pal, Lord Essex, put a word in and got him the job of Master and Composer of the State Music of Ireland. But here, those pesky penal laws raised their head yet again. Remember those? From 1795, Irish people were discriminated against on the basis of religion. Catholics couldn't. So because Giminiani was Catholic, the Prime Minister objected to him getting a state post. Ouch, that must have hurt. But also, the post would have been incompatible with his Catholic faith. So in the end, Giminiani didn't do the gig. Instead, it went to his student, Dubourg. Even back then, piracy was a problem in the music industry. And I don't mean the ones on the high seas. Unauthorized editions were reducing Giminiani's profits from his compositions. Giminiani loved visual art. So he had the idea of becoming an art dealer to supplement his income. From 1732, he traveled between Paris and London, buying and selling art. His nose for business, however, wasn't great, and he made some bad decisions. Deeply in debt, he was actually jailed for a short time when a creditor demanded payment. His good pal, the Earl of Essex, had to intervene to get him out. In 1733, another noble patron, the Baron of Tullamore, invited him to visit Dublin. And at that point, this must have seemed like a really good idea. So in 73, Giminiani moved to Dublin for around four months, to the lower end of Dame Street, to be precise, Spring Gardens, where he opened up a combination concert hall and art gallery called Giminiani's Great Room. The upstairs premises was for music and the rooms below for trading in pictures. Doesn't that just sound idyllic? If I had a few hours free on a Saturday in Dublin, I would totally have gone there. In 1734, he either shuttled between Dublin and London or he moved back to London. But we know that from 1737 to 1740, the entrepreneurial Giminiani was back in Dublin, giving private concerts, teaching lessons, art dealing, and publishing more compositions. So there was at least two periods, the first one lasting four months, and the second one lasting a year, when Giminiani was in Ireland and Carolyn was alive. In 1740, Giminiani headed off to Paris for a year, to coordinate publishing more works. And then he returned to London. In 1759, he returned to Ireland to become the violin master of 21-year-old Charles Coote of Coote Hill in Roscommon. Wikipedia Warren alert. That Charles would go on to become the Count of Bellamont and at the age of 35 was badly wounded in a duel with the Marquis Townsend. Townsend shot him in the groin. However, Charles must have recovered because he married Lady Emily Maria Margaret Fitzgerald one year later and went on to have five children. Anyway, before Giminiani's students started getting into jewels, etc., Giminiani must have gotten a break from teaching him every so often because in 1761, he went on a visit to his old violin student, Dubourg, in Dublin. While he was staying in College Green, a servant robbed him of a musical manuscript probably a treatise on harmony on which he had bestowed much time and labor. Supposedly this was devastating for him. One contemporaneous music writer, Hawkins, think that his grief at this loss hastened his death. Personally, I'm not quite so sure because Giminiani died around a year after the theft and at the age of 75, which was pretty good innings around that century. So we know that Giminiani was a brilliant violinist, but what was he like as a composer? Well, 
Hawkins thought that Geminiani's approach represented an important advance in composition. His harmonies consist of such combinations as were never introduced into music till his time. Even Bernie, who's an English music historian who's usually a very stern critic of Geminiani, wrote that the Opus 3 concertos established his character and placed him at the head of all the masters then living in this species of composition. But if Geminiani's performing and composition were so brilliant, why was he not more famous? My pet theory is that his virtuosity constrained his commercial success as a composer because apparently his violin sonatas, Opus 1 and 4 in particular, were so difficult that very few contemporary violinists dared to play them in public. But the more common theory is even weirder. You know the way that people frequently complain that in this era, image is everything in the music industry? You would think that the 1700s, and classical music in particular, would be immune from that. But it turns out that image was important as far back as the 1700s. And the music critics and opinion makers could not get their head around Geminiani's varied income streams. In some eyes, he was a wheeler dealer. Other celebrity violinists presented themselves as being in touch with supernatural forces. And Geminiani, with his performing and composing and teaching and writing and art dealing and concert organizing and self-publishing, and he just did not fit that ideal. So, perhaps unfairly, Geminiani is not as famous as his predecessors Corelli and Vivaldi. But I, a traditional Irish musician, know his name. And why on earth is that? It's because he was hanging out in Ireland at the same time as our most famous Irish harper and composer, Turla Carlin, was around. And we think that they might have met. So for five years, 1733 to 1738, Geminiani and Carlin were both on the island of Ireland. Did these two musical icons get to know each other? Let's try to figure it out. Both Geminiani and Carlin's jobs involved playing music for the upper classes. Geminiani had come to Dublin from London, where he'd lived for 14 years. His good friend, the third Earl of Essex, had helped him to get out of jail, literally, and tried to get him jobs. Another Anglo-Irish peer, Charles Moore, the Baron of Tullamore, invited him to perform in Ireland. From what I can gather, in 1738, there was only around 55 families in Ireland with a title from the English crown. It was a tiny network, and I'm sure they all knew each other. And given that Geminiani was a celebrity and knew at least two members from that extended network, he definitely had an in. Carlin, on the other hand, was a lower class Catholic but it turns out that he was quite popular with that set. When I analysed a list of people that Carlin had composed music for, at least 12 of those families he had worked for had a title from the English crown. So there were only around 55 English titles knocking around the country. They probably all knew each other. Geminiani knew at least one of them and Carlin knew 12. It's very likely that Carlin and Geminiani were just one degree of separation from each other. But is there any evidence? This excerpt is from the 1786 book, A Historical Memoirs of the Irish Bards. Walker writes, It is a fact well ascertained that the fame of Carlin having reached the ears of an eminent music master in Dublin, he put his abilities to a severe test. And the issue of the trial convinced him how well founded everything had been which was advanced in favour of our Irish bard. The method he made use of was as follows. He singled out an excellent piece of music and highly in the style of the country which gave him birth. Here and there he altered or mutilated the piece, but in such a manner as that no one but a real judge could make a discovery. Carlin bestowed the deepest attention upon the performer while he played it, not knowing, however, that it was intended as a trial of his skill. He declared that it was an admirable piece of music, but to the astonishment of all present, said very humorously, Toshir Hosher Bakig. That is, here and there it limps and stumbles. He was prayed to rectify the errors, which he accordingly did. In this state, the piece was sent from Connacht to Dublin, and the Italian no sooner saw the amendments that he pronounced Carolyn to be a true musical genius. 
The antiquarian who wrote this, Joseph Cooper Walker, can be a bit inaccurate on occasion. According to O'Sullivan, who is the king of Carlin research, some of Walker's facts are clearly erroneous. And this is quite a fanciful story. However, it is backed up by the fact that a great family friend of Carlin, Charles O'Connor, wrote that Carolyn excited the wonder and obtained the approbation of a great master who never saw him. I mean, Giminiani. And I think that this scale is a bit too involved for Walker, no matter how creative he was, to have just pulled out of the sky. So I think that it is highly probable that somehow, through correspondence at least, Giminiani formed a good opinion of Carlin. Funnily, an alternative telling of that story has Giminiani rewrite an Irish melody so that the original melody is concealed and then send it to be performed for Carlin. The story continues in an identical way. Carlin listens, gives the verdict and sends a corrected version of the music back to Giminiani, who then pronounces Carlin's genius. To me, both scenarios are equally plausible. That Carlin recognised the hidden Gaelic melody or that he spotted the errors in the performance of an Italian piece. But personally, I actually think it's more likely that Carlin spotted the errors in the Italian piece, for reasons I'll divulge later. Having heard the two quotes from Walker and O'Connor, what do you think? Did Giminiani and Carlin correspond? And do you think it was a hidden Irish tune or a flawed Italian piece? Let me know in the comments. And by the way, this is not where this cute story ends. According to Charles O'Connor, Giminiani never met Carlin. But Charles was born in 1710. He was 40 years younger than Carlin, and he wouldn't have known everything that Carlin got up to. And there are a good few people who think that these two maestros met in person. First, let's consider the geography. During his time in Ireland, Giminiani was based in Dublin. In the little biographical information I have on him, there's mention of his travel between London, Dublin and Paris, but no other great centres of civilization, for example, Leitrim, are mentioned. So that doesn't mean he didn't go elsewhere, but if he did, it wasn't documented. Carlin, on the other hand, really got around. He worked in at least 18 of the 30 counties during his lifetime. We know that he worked in Dublin and also five of the counties nearby, Kildare, Longford, Louth, Meath, and Westmeath. He definitely visited Dr. Delaney, a big supporter of his, who lived in Glasnevin, Dublin. The History of the City of Dublin in 1818 tells us that he visited Jonathan Swift, the famous author. The Dean admired Carlin's genius, had him frequently at the Deanery House in Dublin, and used to hear him play and sing the Pleroca. So, geographically, it's quite likely that they were in the same region if not the same county, at the same point. It just so happens that Giminiani arrived in Ireland the same year that Carolyn's wife, Mary, passed away. And weirdly, this strengthens the probability that they met. According to Garrow Joe Halveron, after his wife's death in 1733, Carolyn took to the road again. So he was on a typical tour schedule, rather than staying at home with the wife and kids, from 1733, Garojo Halveron also believes that Carolyn's wife's passing left him severely depressed. And Carolyn, it seems, was always a bit too fond of the drink, but it got to such a serious level after his wife's death that his doctors warned him to stop. Donal O'Sullivan has not one, but two anecdotes about Jonathan Swift, that famous author who lived in Dublin, and Carolyn both of which feature Carlin's heavy drinking as a key element of the story. Therefore, I think it's quite likely that Carlin visited Swift in Dublin while at the rock bottom of his drink problem, which would have been after Mary died in 1733 and coincided with Giminiani's arrival in Dublin. But could Giminiani and Carlin have gotten into the same room? Well, as I mentioned before, Giminiani and Carlin played music for the upper classes. Giminiani was invited to Ireland by the Baron of Tullamore. 
In 1738, there was only around 55 families in Ireland with the title from the English crown. So it was a tiny network and I'm sure they all knew each other. And at least 12 of the families that Carolyn had worked for had a title from the English crown. So I think Carolyn and Jiminy Annie were just one degree of separation from each other. Two sources, Walker and O'Connor, imply that Jiminy Annie corresponded with Carolyn. And I think that's true. As both Jiminy Annie and Carlin were masters in their respective domains, I'm sure they would have been interested in meeting each other, and it's extremely likely that they knew people in common. Therefore, the only barrier I see to their meeting is timing. So what does the literature say about it? In 1760, the writer and poet Oliver Goldsmith wrote, at the house of an Irish nobleman, where there was a musician present who was eminent in the profession, Carolyn immediately challenged him to a trial of skill. His lordship persuaded the musician to accept the challenge, and he accordingly played over in his fiddle the fifth concerto of Vivaldi. Carolyn, immediately taking his harp, played over the whole piece after him without missing a note, though he had never heard it before, which produced some surprise. But their astonishment increased when he assured them he could make a concerto in the same taste himself, which he instantly composed, and that with such spirit and elegance that it may compare, for we have it still, with the finest compositions of Italy. Who was that mysterious famous fiddler? Well, one possible clue is that he played music by Vivaldi, a famous Italian composer. So we could take this reference at face value and extrapolate that the person playing the Italian music was also Italian. Unfortunately, this is probably not wise because Italian music was all the rage at the time. So hearing Vivaldi at a house party then was probably as normal as hearing an Ed Sheeran song at a wedding now. So we will never know. But in summary, cute story by Goldsmith, 1760, says unnamed famous fiddler met Carlin. They had a playoff, Fiddler played Vivaldi, Carlin instantly composed a concerto in the same style. My hero, Bunting, a harp collector, gives the same version of this tale, practically word for word, in his introduction to his 1840 volume, except that he references volume 50 of the 1787 periodical The Monthly Review and prefaces this excerpt with At the house of an Irish nobleman, where Geminiani was present. And yay, we found out who it was. The mysterious musician was Geminiani, right? Um, no. When Donal O'Sullivan, the king of Carlin research, went looking at Bunting's reference, there was no mention of this story to be found there. Instead, there was a scathing review of a book called A Historical Memoir of the Irish Bards. The only explanation I can think of is that my hero, Edward Bunting, must have been having a bad day and just gotten his reference notes mixed up, just this one time. And I could go through the 91 years of the monthly review periodicals up to 1840 and manually look for the correct Bunting reference, but the fact that there actually was an entry to do with Harp at volume 50 implies to me that Bunting inserted the wrong Harp reference from his manuscripts taking this note rather than this one. Not that he made a typo regarding the wrong page or volume. So I'm not sure that's the best use of my time. But if you're interested, the great news is that 95 years of the monthly review periodicals are all online and free here. So in summary, until someone proves me wrong, Bunting, in 1840, says the unnamed famous fiddler in Goldsmith's story is Giminiani. But his reference doesn't agree. So I think this isn't true. So that author who got that scathing review in the monthly review, volume 50, 1787, was antiquarian Joseph Cooper Walker. Walker was born 24 years after Carlin died. At a mere 24 years old, he published Historical Memoirs of the Irish Bards. He was working in Dublin and he got most of his data on Carlin from an anonymous source. After the book was published, Walker sent a copy to Charles O'Connor, a family friend of Carlin. O'Connor responded to him, 
In casting my eye over Carlin's life, I find that your anonymous correspondent trusted too much to informers who were ill-informed themselves. For being himself a child when Carlin died, he could furnish you with nothing from his own knowledge. As such, we know that a significant amount of Walker's biography of Carlin is at third hand and ill-informed. However, Carlin scholars don't entirely dismiss Walker. And Walker writes, in the beginning of the last century, the then Lord Mayo brought from Dublin a celebrated Italian performer to spend some time with him at his seat in the country. Carlin, who was at that time on a visit at his lordship's, found himself greatly neglected and complained of it one day in the presence of the foreigner. When you play in as masterly a manner as he does, replies his lordship, you shall not be overlooked. Carlin wagered with the musician that though he was almost a stranger to Italian music, yet he would follow him in any piece he played and that he himself would afterwards play a voluntary in which the Italian should not follow him. The proposal was acceded to and Carlin was victorious, although there's a few differences here. The themes remain the same as in Goldsmith's account. In summary, Walker, 1786, says a famous Italian fiddler met Carlin, they had a playoff, the fiddler played Italian music, Carlin improvised in the same style, Carlin wins. But a year after this was first published, Walker reproduced it in a magazine called the Dublin Chronicle on the 5th of July 1787 with one significant addition. He then said that the visiting Italian performer was Giminiani. Charles O'Connor's opinion of Walker's work, allied with the lack of consistency in his two accounts, combined with the lack of explanation for his second account, makes me sure that this story is not entirely correct. For the record though, 21 years after Carolyn had died, Giminiani did move to the big house Coot Hill in Roscommon to be a violin tutor to Charles Coote. So it's obvious that he was open to staying in the houses of the gentry in the West of Ireland. And for all his faults, Walker's story is plausible within what we know of Giminiani's career. And finally, we have the Reverend Thomas Campbell. Campbell was 29 years older than Walker. He was five years old when Carlin died. His uncle, Baptist Johnson, was a patron of Carlin, had a piece composed in his honour and named after him. Campbell visited various parts of Ireland and in 1777 wrote a philosophical survey of the south of Ireland, where he records his impressions of what he saw and heard. Chronologically, socially and geographically, Campbell was far closer to the subject of Carlin than Walker was. Campbell only wrote a few sentences about Carlin, as opposed to the essays of Goldsmith, Bunting or Walker, but they include his ear was so exquisite and his memory so tenacious that he has been known to play off at first hearing some of the most difficult pieces of Italian music to the astonishment of Giminiani. The only way Giminiani could have heard Carlin play and therefore have been astonished by him was if he was in the same room. So did Carlin meet Giminiani? It's up to you to decide who you believe. Goldsmith, Bunting, Walker or Campbell? Let me know what you think in the comments. Personally, I think Carlin did meet Giminiani. And did they have that playoff? Well, that's a subject for another day. But there's one thing that I can cling to for certain. Carlin was hugely influenced by the Italian composers. So right now, I am going to relax after all that research by playing a piece of music which exemplifies Carolyn's joyous fusion of Gaelic harp and classical Italian composition, Van Boss.
Hi there, so um, today I'm going to play a tune called O'Carlin's Devotion, um, which is a tune in the key of G, so we need our F sharps up. Um, I'm going to play it once and through slowly, I'll play the first part twice, and the second part I'll just play once for now because it's quite long. Um, then I'll just go through it slowly so you can kind of have a look at uh, how it's played and have a little listen to it. Um, and after that I will go through some of the left hand that I'm doing which is totally optional, um, but it'll give you something to experiment with. All right, so. quite a bit so it goes all the way up to your high C and it goes up to the high D later on so so lots of cuts and ornaments in it as well cutting on to the A cutting on to the E from the G and then I just do an arpeggio G on my right hand so lots of chords and things you can do here so I can do it you can do a C major chord here or you can do it uh, an A minor chord here either. And for here I do a D, G, and A. I'm playing the F sharp after as kind of a suspension. So that again. fingers up from G but skip and C. Cutting from G to the E. And that goes to the B twice. And then down to C. phrase and D F G and you could do um, a little ornament there so that's A B A G G and then a chord there A minor chord I use Do what I did earlier, which was D, G, and A, and then F 
get sharp to finish, okay? So, uh, for the left hand, which you can take some ideas, all the ideas, or none, whatever you prefer, but I start with an A minor. Running up like that, so that's A, E, and A, going up to the B and C, so going up to the tenth. Um, and you could do F sharp, D, and F. Or you could do just a D. C. D seventh. G. A minor again. Just running up this time, but not using the F sharp here. Skipping it and going B, G, B. C. And then a low D. Um, it's the same again, but try to vary where I'm playing, so maybe go up, move up a little bit. And then you could do C, G, B, G, A, G, G to finish. Um, if you do lots of chords on your right hand, then you don't need to do that much on your left hand, so you can just do single notes.
hope you enjoyed that. It's a nice one for weddings and functions and things like that. Um, and hopefully you can take some ideas from the left hand there as well. Okay, thank you.
that was Katie Bustard playing one of my harps. I'm Mervyn Woe and I've been making these Termenon Alas for some years now. They've proven very popular. I've been selling a lot of them here in Ireland and many of them overseas as well. Um, however, I've decided the time has come when I should uh, hang up the tools and uh, do my best to retire. Now, I'm not saying I'll never make another harp, but uh, I'm definitely not taking any more orders. And this is probably one of the last alas that I will make. Now, the Terminan name uh, is in good hands. I'm passing it on to the next generation. My son Brian is making a range of student harps. There's the Learner 26 and the Learner 34. They're aimed at the serious student who wants a, a quality harp, but at an entry level price. They're a bit simpler in construction than the Alla, but uh, I'll let him tell you about them. I'm Brian. I'm taking over somewhat the Termenon uh, harps from my father, Mervyn. Um, I've just been stringing, I'm in the process of stringing this Learner 34 harp. Um, the, the Learner 34 is principally the same string layout, same string spacing, same strings, uh, fluorocarbon and strings as the Ella. Um, it's uh, levered with Camag levers also. The main differences in it are that it's um, it's a simpler construction in that it's a solid maple harp and it has a straight four post and the soundboard is made from aircraft plywood. Um, it's a, a rectangular um, shaped uh, sound box. Um, it has quite a large, large bass on it. There's a lot of volume from the bottom strings. Um, it's nice and bright in the middle. As well as the Learner 34, I also make uh, a 26 string harp, which um, strangely I call the Learner 26. It's principally the same as the 34, only it has the bottom octave um, isn't there, uh, leaving the top 26 strings. It's um, aimed at children, shorter arms, don't reach as far down the harp and therefore don't reach the bottom strings. It's also particularly favoured by people who are looking for um, a transportable harp, one that will fit easily into luggage compartments perhaps on aircraft and that they can take on the bus with them and so on. Some people um, have bought it as far afield as America, um, Shanghai, um, there's, there's har these harps all over the world. Um, and it's it's suited to people that want to have a harp that they can carry around with them. They'll bring it maybe to the pub, um, they'll bring it to a friend's house. Um, again, it's um, a plywood uh, soundboard construction. It's solid maple with fluorocarbon strings, again, levered with Camac levers. Levers on each of these harps uh, can be fitted in any combination of, of your choice. Some go for CNF, some BCNF, some go fully levered. Um, so I lever the, the harp in any combination that you desire. As well as my Learner 34 and the Learner 26, uh, I also have a harp kit which we've designed. Uh, it's a 26 string harp in a box. The harp itself is computer cut from birch faced plywood. Um, all the pieces will fit perfectly together as it is computer cut. Everything that you need to make the harp is contained in the box, right down to the glue, the screws, the screwdriver, even the sandpaper. The only thing that you will need to finish the harp is whichever finish that you desire, be that paint or lacquer or whichever. Uh, full instructions come with the harp and they're printed, they're inside the box. The instructions also are available on the website and we think the Build a Harp sounds pretty good. As I say, I've just been putting some strings in this Learner 34 harp. Um, stringing is something that people would often ask me is, you know, how do you tie the, the toggle on the string? Each of the strings has, um, our harps we put a wooden toggle at the back uh, so that it makes nice contact with the, the soundboard. 
And people often ask, how do you tie the string? It's not particularly difficult, but it's something that people are daunted by because it's a small toggle, a fine string and so on. So I'm going to show you now how I tie a toggle onto a harp. Now for the purposes of this, this the toggles are, are very small and the strings are very thin. So I'm going to use this, which will probably end up a tuning key or one of my other harps. And this piece of wire. Now, it starts out simply as one loop, which is tied in a half knot or a half granny knot or some people I think call it, like that. Toggle then goes through that loop and build, which leaves the tail out one side and half a knot here. This end is then looped over itself to create a loop like that. And then over the toggle and feed the tail through that, that end. And then when that's pulled tight, just position it nicely in the middle of your toggle. When that's pulled tight, that will get tighter as the string pulls. That knot will go nowhere. If you're using it on a very fine string, you can maybe go over again and just loop it one more time, just over the top as you did before, and that'll just give you that extra bit. Not completely necessary, but on a smaller, finer string, it can help in case it would slip. Thanks very much for watching. I hope that all made sense. If anybody has any questions in relation to my harps, uh, please feel free to get in touch. Contact details are available on the websites. Hello there, I'm delighted to be playing for you today to celebrate Harp Day and I was going to talk a little bit about the connections between Ireland and Scotland and the harp and its history there and uh, going 
long way back, uh, the, the Scots were a people who came from the north part of Ireland into the western part of what is now Scotland. They gave Scotland its name and they became the dominant people there in the western isles, in the highlands of Scotland and brought with them their language and culture and music of course and many of the harpers over the years would have quite naturally travel from the north of Ireland into the west of Scotland. There were a lot of uh, wealthy patrons and castles and stately homes who would have welcomed harpers from Ireland. And one of the best known of the Scottish uh, harpers is Rory Dal Cahan, who was from uh, Derry area in the north of Ireland and he was a gentleman harper. He would have had servants to help him carry his instrument etc. And uh, he was very well received in Scotland and uh, played in many of the stately homes and castles and he spent the last 10 or 11 years of his life in Scotland. This is a tune of his called Lute's Supper which was composed around about 1640. Uh, written uh, for I believe the Robertson family who would have been great sponsors of the harp um, just north of Perth and uh, I guess that whole area was known for being very uh, favourable towards the harp in fact the Queen Mary harp and the, the Lament harp were probably preserved there for many years. I'll play a uh, part of a Pibroch um, which is called the Cave of Gold.
finish now uh, with another piece that's attributed to Rory Dahl and uh, this is Rory Dahl's port and we, we didn't have the good fortune of having a lot of the, the heart repertoire written down. Uh, we had no Edward Bunting in Scotland uh, but a lot of the melodies survive in other ways in the repertoire of the bagpipe or sometimes in Luke manuscript and in this case the first the first line of Rory Dahl's Port was used many many years later by Robert Burns as the melody of the song A Fond Kiss and he used that melody for a while and then he switched it to another tune uh, which then became the better known melody. So I'll finish now with some of Rory Dahl's Port
Misha reads the book and the shed off her. He reads a passage and is out in the ocean. which means a waltz for Jane. called On Quiver Lat on Iha Ud, Song Air Arranged by Granya Yates. jigs called the rolling waves and shames coolies.
Jeffrey falling down to memory. speech by Michael Lewis.
Hello, this is Gil Sando, and we are from County Cork. We are going to play a plantry called George Brabazon. This piece was composed by Turlock O'Carroll around 1730 for George Brabazon of New Park, County Mayo. It is arranged for harp ensemble by Dermot. Hi, my name is Kellyanne French and I am from Lep County Cork. I am going to begin with a piece called The Princess Royal, composed by Turlico Carlin for MacDermot, Prince of Coolavin. It is one of Carlin's most celebrated pieces. I will follow that with a well-known jig called Gallagher's Frolics, published by O'Neill in his Dance Music of Ireland in 1907. The version that I am going to play today was arranged by Bronya Hamley.
Kinsale, County Cork. I am going to play a piece called Madame Call, which is one of Terlock O'Carolan's finest airs. It shows very clearly his admiration for Baroque music. This piece was written for the marriage of Jane Saunderson of Castle Saunderson, County Cavan. This version was arranged by Granny Lee. Thank you. 
It's Misha Ellen de Burka, August is as Kilna Martra, a Gunte Karki me. In Ove Tome come go fart a hyant di, on Kate Kiao na planks di Erwin. Come Turlaco Carolyn A, dun Colonel John Erwin, a Gunte Litrima, Savlin Shock Jig, Octo Hain. On Dara Pert na, the humours of Dingle, August Valley Good Mane, a Guiga Moon, Marin La Kui Kate Pert Ella. Katrina McKay from Scotland. The Swan is a small fishing boat and Katrina McKay composed this tune when she was on board the Swan when it set sail from Shetland to take part in the Cutty Sack um, Tall Ships Race in 1999. We are then going to follow that piece with a jig called Covering Ground that we learned from Leisha Kelly at the Willie Clancy Summer School. <laughs> 